This morning, our gospel takes us to the Last Supper that Jesus is sharing with his disciples before he begins his journey toward the cross. And throughout the meal, Jesus has been dropping hints about having to leave his disciples soon, not only in his impending death on the cross, but also in his ascension into heaven. Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, Jesus tells his disciples just before this morning's reading. But there will come a time when you will follow me. Now, the disciples are quite scared, and it's no wonder they are. They had left their homes and jobs to follow Jesus, had spent the past few years traveling with, learning from, and hanging out with him, and they no longer know what life would look like without him. So now what are they supposed to do when their rabbi, their teacher and dear friend, was going to leave them? How were they supposed to continue to share the good news about God's love through Jesus Christ without Jesus himself? How would they know what to do when he was gone? And how on earth would they be able to get by without their dear friend whom they loved? The story their fear was telling them had overcome them. In the chapters we are reading this week from our Lenten book called How Not to Be Afraid, author Gareth Higgins discusses three common types of fears. And I wonder if these were the fears that overcame Jesus' disciples during their last meal with him. Did they fear they would be all alone after Jesus' departure? Without him ha ha having him around to guide them on the right path, would they make mistakes that could never be fixed? And would they no longer be able to live meaningful lives without him guiding their way? I think these are fears we all have at some point or even many points in our lives, and that is okay. You see, while Jesus is not giving his disciples or any of us quick fix answers or solutions, he is also not saying that we must just get over our feelings, ignore the injustice around us, and hold on to a false sense of hope. Of anyone, Jesus knows what it is like to feel afraid. As someone who lived under and resisted an imperialist state, and when he resisted, he did so at the expense of being isolated from community, loved ones, and eventually becoming a victim of state brutality. And yet, as we find throughout the Gospels, Jesus does not brush his feelings under the rug and pretend that everything is okay when it is not. Rather, he expresses his feelings. He calls out injustice and channels his fear and anger toward his work in dismantling the injustice. And he also takes time to lament, to weep, to grieve, and to be intentional about spending time both alone in solitude and surrounded by his community. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid, Jesus says, not as a directive for us to just get over our feelings. Rather, he says it in order to offer some sense of peace and hope in the midst of our fears, despair, and uncertainty. For although it may not seem like it right now, there will come a time when we will find ourselves out of the, mist, the wilderness and beyond the cross. For the promise we have in Easter, which comes at the end of this Lenten journey, is that fear, trouble, and death will not have the last word. In his book, Gareth explains that fear is a natural feeling, and like any feeling we have, it is valid. So we should not feel embarrassed, angry at ourselves, or ashamed when we do feel afraid. In an earlier chapter, Gareth states that despite its title, this book does not actually lay out the how-tos for not being afraid. Of course we will feel afraid. 
Fear is an emotion, and really feeling our emotions is what makes us human. Gareth explains that his book would be better titled, How to Be Afraid Well. There will be times when we are afraid, but the important thing to remember is what we do with our fear. According to Gareth, the stories we tell shape how we experience everything. This means that with fear, we must retell the story. Because fear has power to control and overcome us only when we allow it to be the storyteller. And when we allow fear to take over, we tend to do one of three things. We fight back, we flee, or we freeze. Each of these responses to fear holds us back from recognizing and experiencing the divine in nature, in the people around us, and within ourselves. It keeps us from living fully as the people God created us to be and loving in the ways God commands us to love. And so in order to not allow fear to hold us back, in order to be afraid well, we need to take back control of the narrative around our fear. We need to be the ones to retell the story that shapes our view of the world and the ways in which we interact with it. Now, Gareth suggests that the first step in doing this is to ask ourselves, what is the fear underneath the fear that's on the surface? What is really behind our fear of being alone? What is really behind our fear of doing something that cannot be fixed? What is really behind our fear of not having a meaningful life? And consequently, what is it that is holding us back from loving radically as God commands us to? For Gareth, what's behind the fear of being alone is that nobody will actually know him. He says the fear of being alone is not about the aloneness itself, but the impact of the loneliness. What will we do when we are alone? What will we use to protect ourselves? Who will let us know that everything is okay or help us get out of the way when it's not? Who will love us? But Gareth says that being known is not something to be achieved, but rather to be experienced. And according to him, the way to un overcome the fear of being alone is to find friendship with God and with yourself. If no other human fully knows us, this much is true. We are fully known by God. And we can also become known deeply by our own self. We can be the best lovers of us. Gareth explains that in addition to seeking therapy, which I do and I strongly recommend that everyone who can does as well, one way to heal your loneliness is taking the journey to becoming your own best friend. He says, if it seems counterintuitive to suggest that the way to heal your loneliness is to spend more time alone with yourself, I understand. But plenty of healing comes from doing the opposite of what seems obvious. The mystics know that you should practice meditation an hour each day, unless you're too busy, in which case you should practice it for twice as long. Gareth suggests that one way to begin the journey of finding friendship with God and with yourself is through prayer. But he does not define prayer as just the words we speak to God. Rather, prayer is anything that unfolds love in us. I love this definition so much and think it's a great question we should be asking ourselves daily. What is it that unfolds love in us? And how can we ensure that is regularly incorporated 
into our lives? The answer to this question will be different for each and every one of us. For me, it's taking long walks in the city and noticing the small buds in the winter and the beautiful flowers in the spring. It's running into strangers at the Montrose Bird Sanctuary and sometimes friends and sharing together the excitement we feel when we spot a particular bird. It's reading a book in my hammock by the lake, taking photos of the beauty I notice around me, having solo dance parties in my kitchen uh, while I'm making dinner. It's gathering with hundreds of neighbors to march in the streets for justice, volunteering in the community and attending drum circles at the beach. I love what one friend who has also found healing through drum circles shared on his Facebook page last week. He posted an image of himself playing the djembe and wrote, we pray while we play. Now these are all ways that unfold love to me and they are forms of prayer. The things that unfold love for us bring us into communion with God, reminding us that the divine is present in all places people, music, nature, experiences. When I commune with God through these forms of prayer, I recognize that I am also in communion with all the people I encounter, even if no words are spoken. I love to people watch wherever I'm at. It's a way for me to see how other people interact with and find joy in the world and how love is in unfolded to them. But it is also a way for me to remember that God has created us as communal beings and that we are all interconnected, even if we do not know each other. When I notice residents of the Breakers Retirement Center exercising together on the lakefront path, or the children laughing and twirling in circles on the sand, or the multi-generational families barbecuing on the grass, or the individual playing with their dog. I recognize their humanity, their divineness, and I am reminded that their life and mine are intertwined, that their joy is my joy and their liberation is tied to mine. When I spend time alone reading a book, taking in the small signs of spring or dancing for hours by myself in my kitchen, I love learning, I am learning to love spending time with myself and learning to love who I am. And so even when I might be in situations where I am solo, I am not in fact alone. And I am indeed being made no known. Because I am growing in my own understanding of who I am, whose I am, and who I am becoming. But this is not always easy. Sometimes it can be quite hard for us. And just like in mastering any skill, instrument, or other form of art, it requires a lot of intentionality and practice. And so I would like to challenge each one of you to really take some time to think about two questions this upcoming week. The first, what are the things that unfold love to you? What are the things that unfold love to you? And how will you get to know and love yourself better? How will you get to know and love yourself better? Now in John, just before this morning's reading, Peter, who is still struggling to retell the story that his fears have been shaping, desperately asks Jesus, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus urges Peter and the rest of the disciples to be patient and to hold on to hope. Don't let your hearts be troubled. 
You have faith in God, have faith in me as well. In God's house, there are many dwelling places. Otherwise, how could I have told you that I was going to prepare a place for you? I am indeed going to prepare a place for you, and then I will come back to take you with me, that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way that leads to where I am going. But the disciples still do not understand, and likely because of their grief and their fear, they try to convince him to stay. Thomas replies, but we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I myself am the way, Jesus replies. I am the truth, and I am life. No one comes to the parent God but through me. If you really knew me, you would know the parent God also. From this point on, you know the parent God, and you have seen God. Now this text has often been taken out of context and misused and abused, and that's an entirely different sermon for another day. But in a nutshell, the thing to note is that the way Jesus is speaking of was a popular Greek concept that was best understood as way of life. And throughout his ministry, Jesus calls his disciples and all of us to follow his way of life. A way in which he commands us to radically love one another just as he has loved us. In How Not to Be Afraid, Gareth Higgin, Higgins um, suggests that the way of life we are called to will actually help us in overcoming our fears. He says the answer to two questions, how you can be of service to your own loneliness and how you can be of service to the loneliness of the world is the same. You see, when we love ourselves and others, and when we join God in co-creating a more just, equitable, and loving world, our fears will start to lose their hold on us. And then we will have a meaningful life. Now in our gospel, it takes the disciples a long time to understand this. And so still confused, Philip chimes in, show us the parent God and that will be enough for us. In times like these, where the world is overwhelmed by gun violence, genocide, all kinds of division, hatred, injustice, poverty, many of us may feel like Peter and Thomas desperately wondering where God is in the midst of all of this and where we must go or what we must do in order to find God. Like Philip, we may be longing to find proof that God actually cares. Show us God, we desperately cry out. Whoever has seen me, Jesus replies, has seen the parent God. In these times, when we wonder what kind of a God we have, we can look to Jesus' teachings, works, and way of life. And when we do, we will find that we have a God who proclaims good news to the poor, release to the captives, gives sight to those who cannot see, and liberates the oppressed. We have a God who feeds the hungry, welcomes the stranger, clothes the naked, and visits the sick. When we wonder where God is in the midst of the world's troubles and horrors, we can look to the faces of those who have been deemed the least of these, and there we will find God. As Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem, said in one of his recent sermons, God is under the rubble in Gaza. God is with the frightened and the refugees. God is in the operating room. This is our consolation. God accompanies us through the valley of the shadow of death. 
if we want to pray, my prayer is that those who are suffering will feel this healing and comforting presence. We can also find God when we look for the people around us who are following Jesus' way of life by caring and advocating for those who are most vulnerable, by calling out and working to dismantle injustice, and by sharing radical love to a hurting world. God is right there in the midst of it all. I love a reflection called What I Mean by God that was written by Reverend M. Jade Kaiser and shared this week on the Enfleshed social media accounts. They wrote, What I mean by God is bread for everyone, is shared rage at cruelty, is attention where it is needed, is grief held in community, is blooming uninhibited, is water flowing freely, is children at ease, is mystery and magic, is how trustworthy the rising, collective and determined, powered by love, rooted in spirit, sharing in risk. May we choose the path to this God, and in doing so, may we be afraid well, so that we do not allow our fears to hold us back. Because when we do follow Jesus' way of radical love, we might be surprised at how much more of a loving and just world we have the ability to co-create. Miracles can happen. We can move mountains together. For as Jesus reminds us this morning, the truth of the matter is anyone who has faith in me will not only do the works I do, but greater works besides. Amen.